Um, so today I am, I'm going to preach way out of my comfort level. Uh, I like to be, uh, I like to be the smartest person in the room and I am not today. Uh, a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago, started putting this together some messages, uh, on the idea of stewardship and I think so often we kind of have a, a very narrow view when we hear about stewardship, it's inevitably about money. Um, and I, I don't, I think stewardship is so much more than that. And, and it's so much more when it comes to just what God wants for our life. And, and I think we get into this mindset of like a, a tithe that like when we talk about finances, we talk about tithing. When we talk about tithing, that means 10%, right? And so if God wants 10% of that, then he would want 10% of everything else. That's why about 10% of my week I'll use for church and Bible studies. Uh, about 10% of my free time I'll use for reading of God's word and prayer. About 10% of my time with my friends will be used for godly French. And it's a total misunderstanding of what God wants for our life. So that's why we're doing this series on stewardship. It's not about money, mostly. All right. And today, I wanted to challenge myself. I've preached through different stewardship things before, and, I, and I've, I've put together little pieces like of this before, and I just never could quite, I'm like, you know, I never quite found this something. I was just determined. I said, you know what? I really want to read everything that God's Word has to say on what it means to be a good steward of the earth. What it means to be a good steward of the earth. All right? And there really is a divide in the, in the Christian community on what that means. What does it mean uh, to be a good steward of the earth? And when you, when you search the internet uh, and go on Google and what it says, all right, you basically kind of find two general responses. Response number one is, this is God's earth and all that are in it are his creatures and we are to take care of them. And they use lots of verses to kind of describe that, that we are to take care of God's earth and take care of the creatures that are in it. The other kind of response, if I had to summarize it, is that God is going to destroy this earth eventually, and it's designed to wear out, so why try to save it? And so that obviously even puts kind of the Christian community at odds with one another, on what is our role and responsibility? What, what does God's Word actually have to say? So what this is and isn't, I'm just going to deal with what God's Word says. I'm not going to get into how, what, what product should you be recycling because God's Word doesn't talk about that. All right, so I'm going to deal with specifically, it gives us a framework, all right, for you to then be able to kind of continue on, pray, seek God, what do you want me to do? Please share more with me. I, uh, I've watched, you point me to different documentaries on Netflix. I, I've watched a lot of them. I, I, I've, seen, I've seen the best ones, I think. But if there's some deep down recess uh, in, the, in the darks of, uh, of Netflix that you can point me to another documentary that talks about these things, I, I'm down. I like to watch that stuff. All right, so let's dig into what God's Word says. And what we're going to turn first is in Genesis chapter 1. And in Genesis, uh oh, I want to have it here. Got in the wrong spot, sorry. All right, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. And we'll break that down in pieces. And I have some other places that we're going to jump all over the place. So what is man's responsibility when it comes to being a steward of God's earth? And in Genesis 1, 26, it says this. So I got seven facts that I was able to break out of Genesis 1, 26 through, 30, um, through 31. Uh, so 26, uh, verse 26 says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So this is God speaking. All right? And when he looks at human, fact number one is that humans are unique creations of God. We are not just one of the many creations of God. We are a unique creation of God. God created everything. He created light. He created trees. He created grass. He created aardvarks. He created everything. 
All right? And in the midst of that creation, this is the only conversation we get. And this is God speaking. He says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. All right? And so we are in the image of God. Nothing else is in the image of God. When we talk about the image of God, there's, I think there's a lot that goes into that. And I, uh, there's whole sermons that I can preach on what it means to be in the image of God. And I've got to kind of sum it up briefly. We are eternal beings, just as God is eternal, existing forever in eternity past and forever in eternity future. We, too, have a starting point. We were created, but just like God, we are in his image. It's like a shadow. It's like a reflection. We will go on into eternity, just as God has will and desire. We have will and desire. Just as God is all-powerful, he can do everything we have some power. We can do some things. Just as God is, uh, um, knows absolutely everything. He's omniscient. He knows everything. We know some things. We can learn and we can grow and we can adapt. Just as God has emotions in perfection, we too have emotions in imperfection. All the things that God is in his power and his might, he is everywhere and we are somewhere. All right? We reflect. We are images of him and we are created in his image. It has nothing to do with the way we look, meaning arms and legs. It has everything to do with a spiritually speaking. That in the same way, and I think beyond spiritually as well, in the same way that God sees everything, we can see some things, that he hears everything, we can hear some things. He doesn't have ears to hear and eyes to see. That's what the organs we use to reflect God's image. But in all ways, we are like God because God created us like him. And we are unique amongst his creation. There is nothing else like us. All right, so when we compare created things, all right, we are not able to be compared to anything else, any other animal, any other plant. All right, we can't look at us and say, eh, it's all creation of God. God loves all his creation equally. Uh-uh. All right, there is a create. he loves his creation, but there is a creation that is unique because we are made in his image. All right? It's the unique thing like, you know, I love, I like love all kids. Sure, I love kids. All right, you hear something horrible on the news about something horrible happening to a kid. You're like, oh, why am I watching the news? All right? You feel terrible, but there's a difference when it's your kid. There's a difference when it's your child. Your child. All right? That is, I think, in the same way there is creation of God, and then there's the unique creation of God that's in his image. Humans are unique. Fact number one, let's go on to fact number two. And it says, continuing on in verse 26, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Creepers. Fact number two. We are to rule over the animals. All right? There is not any number of animals that equals a human life. You could add up a whole species and it wouldn't equal human life. We, we, dealt, we dealt with this a little bit and it was just an interesting kind of conversation I thought was kind of happening uh, in the world when that, uh, that little boy like fell into the Cincinnati Zoo and there's like, oh man, there's Harambe. We all love Harambe, all right? And there's this little child in there, and they had to make the decision to shoot the gorilla. And we were all like, oh, don't shoot the gorilla. Nobody wanted the gorilla to be shot. I didn't want the gorilla to be shot, all right? And everyone became instantaneously on the internet became zoology experts because they're saying like, look at his posture. That is a posture of protection. He's protecting the child. I'm like, maybe? Um... <laughs> I had no idea. This is, this is the, the discussion I began to see kind of happening on social media was happening of like, man, look, we got 7 billion people on the earth and there's only like 28 of these silverback gorillas left on the planet. Come on, man, you can't shoot that. Look, look there's plenty of kids out there. There is no way of doing the math to make a human child anywhere close to valuable as a silverback gorilla. It's not close. This is not like, ah, well, if you had three silverback gorillas, all the silverback gorillas. 
if it meant truly saving the life. I'm not talking about some kind of comfort. I'm not talking about, oh, let's destroy habitats because then my house has a better view of the jungle. I'm talking about saving a life. I'm talking about the value of life. Humans are to rule over the animals. And we're going we're gonna to dig into what that fully means here in a moment, so I'm not going to go too much into it now, but we are to rule over the, the animals. All right? We are in charge of them. We are responsible to them. Imagery all throughout the Bible always has this kind of imagery of the shepherd, that the shepherd is to take care of the sheep. Yes, those sheep are going to die. All right? Those sheep, at some point in their life, are going to die. They're either going to be killed for meat, they're going to be um, used for the sacrifices. These animals, all right, they're protecting them to die, but they protect them with their lives, all right, because they see the value in protecting those animals. They see the value and the responsibility that it is to rule over those animals. And that is the responsibility God has given us to all animals. We are responsible for them. We are to rule over them. He continues, repeats himself a little bit, verse 28 here. God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female, he created them. So fact 1A is you're either male or female, but I guess that's a different sermon series. All right, verse, continue on verse 28 here. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth. And subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God blessed them, and God said to them. So that's our fact number three. I got four facts in this one particular verse here. Fact number one is that we're blessed by God. God blessed them, talking about the human beings. He blessed them. In the Old Testament, blessing always kind of means the same thing. All right, it means the presence of God that brings abundance. Anytime you see the word blessing, always remember that that blessing is the presence of God that brings abundance. All right, so a lot of times when we hear the word blessing, because it's the way we use it, you know, like, oh, wow, what a beautiful house you just had built, or what a beautiful house you just bought, like, oh, such a blessing. All right, like, oh, man, I love your new car. How many horsepower does it look? It's such a blessing, 320, it's such a blessing. Um, like, we use the term blessing as a, like, yeah, look at all this great stuff I have. It's a blessing. But the way that Scripture uses the term blessing is when God's presence is with you, you are blessed. And if God's presence is not with you, you're in trouble. Blessed, in trouble. You're safe, you're going to die. God's presence is what we should always desire. And with his presence comes abundance. His presence in battle means victories. His presence in, in your family means health. His presence in uh, when, uh, when you like uh, are farming means abundance of crops. And when you're Cultivating animals means abundance of live young. His presence brings these things. So what happens in our everyday life when we're saying like, why am I not experiencing this? Why am I not experiencing health in my family? Or why am I not experiencing success in my businesses? Why am I not experiencing these things? We start questioning God. God, are you not with me? Are you not here? Do you not care about me? Are you not with me? You say that you bless them. Why am I not experiencing your blessings. All right, and there's all sorts. The, uh, the book of Job is a whole book dedicated to this idea of how come the righteous suffer? How come? How, it seems like when you read like the Proverbs and Psalms, it's like, yeah, the upright man and the, the godly person and the, the godly wife, all these incredible things happen. And when I don't experience it, what is going on? And, it, and there is, again, a whole book of the Bible dedicated to why does sometimes the righteous suffer? The presence of God is what we should always desire. The outcome, the human eye, our eyes outcome is always very short-sighted. 
we sometimes can't, we, we never, sometimes, we never can see too far in the distance of what God is doing. God's presence is his blessing. And he promises to be with us and bring us abundant life. And sometimes, in the short-sighted, we can't fully see it. This is where we trust him that the next step, that there is blessings to come. We ultimately know heaven is the ultimate place of blessing where you get to spend all eternity with him. No other creation of God gets to boast and be excited that one day I get to fully be in the presence of God for all eternity. All dogs do not go to heaven. My dog will. I don't know about yours. Not my present one. He's not going. He's not going. I'm talking about Chester. Good old Chester. Fact number four, that we are to be fruitful and multiply. This is the first command we see here in Scripture. It's in verse 28 of Genesis chapter 1. All right, everything else, is, God's just talking, like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to create light, I'm going to do this. And this is now, he says something that he says, hey, humans, he blessed them, and God said to humans, be fruitful and multiply. This is the first command he gives to us, is to have lots of babies. Humans are blessed. Therefore, baby humans are blessings. All right, in Psalm 127.3, it says, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the one whose quiver is full of baby arrows. Of them, sorry. Babies are the only blessing. Listen to this. Babies are the only blessing from God that we want less of. Babies are the only blessing from God we want. Every other thing, when you want, if you went to the store and like, ooh, uh, blessings are free today. Oh, they are. How many blessings would you like? I think one, two blessings. Uh, I, I don't love the way that our society views children anymore. Children are viewed as disposable. Children are viewed as worthy of death before they're even born. Children are seen as burdens rather than blessings. Uh, but babies are blessed because humans are blessed. All right, and we are to be fruitful and multiply. Well, we start seeing the issue with that. On this earth, it's only so big, we are to be fruitful and multiply. Well, how many is too many? How many humans are just too many humans? All right, how many do we really need now? How many people... Should there really be on earth? And he gives us the answer. We are to fill the earth. We are to fill it. All right? Uh, in The Matrix, you know, there's a scene where Agent Smith is like torturing Morpheus. And he says, you know, we had trouble categorizing you humans. You're not like other mammals. You're like a virus. You spread and you consume everything in your path. All right? And he relates humans to a virus, and I kind of understand. I look at it, I agree with him in this sense. Yeah, we're, we're not an animal. I, I know people want to categorize us as just a mammal like any other. And I'm, we certainly fit mammal characteristics, of course. All right? But they, they try to make us just like that we're an advanced animal. And they're missing something very different, that when God created human beings, everything else... He spoke into existence, but with man, he took the earth and he breathed life into it. All right, this is, when it talks about breath, is the idea of spirit, soul, the Holy Spirit, all right, is oftentimes re referred to as the, the breathing out of God. That's how he inspires his word. Breath, spirit are interrelated, and he breathed life into us. It's talking about giving us a spirit. The difference between us that makes us unique amongst animals is a soul. We have a spirit. We are unique creations of God, and we have different purposes than on this earth. I agree. Every other animal, and it's one of my biological arguments that uh, for things, every other animal has makes homeostasis with its environment. There's always an evening out when 
uh, you, you notice this like in, in hunting and different things like that. You know, when the, when the deer and the rabbits get too many, all of a sudden the, uh, the wolves will come in and then they'll start killing everything. And once they start killing everything, there's too many wolves and there's not enough prey. And then the wolves die out and then the prey animals come back. There's always this kind of this ebb and flow, but humans don't work like that. We rule over the earth. We dominate everywhere we go. And there is a responsibility that comes with that, but we have an answer from God for how many people there should be. We should fill the earth. Um, the only people that think that the earth is overcrowded live in big cities. Right? When you actually like drive across America, there is nothing all right, outside of the city. You get outside of the city, you start getting west of the Mississippi, there's nothing. I've driven to California, there's nothing. When they say get gas, that there's not gas for 250 miles, that means there are no people for 250 miles. There is death for 250 miles, all right, and you better have filled up, all right? You better have filled up on water, and you better have filled up on gas. Here's the actual numbers. 0.6% of the Earth's land surface is an artificial surface. So 0.6% of the Earth, and I'm not talking about planet Earth, I'm talking about just the land mass, because 75% of this Earth is covered in water. The 25% that's covered in land, 0.6% of that has an artificial surface, meaning this is an artificial surface. This uh, cement and carpet did not grow naturally. All right? Humans made this cement. 0.6% of the earth. If you add all crop lands, meaning lands that we have tendered and worked on, that's 12.6% of the earth. All right? But in many ways, we have spread out all over the earth. We've spread out since this time. Only 10% of the land mass on earth has no people within, within 48 hours. That's what they describe as truly barren. If people are without, outside of 48 hours walking distance from a particular area, all right, they call that uninhabited. And 10% of the earth is totally, totally uninhabited. So it might feel like we have a lot of people on this earth, but we, we sometimes miss how big the earth is. It's huge. And 7 billion people is minuscule compared to how big the earth is. When you think of the highest of the high mountains, Mount uh, Everest, all right, it is higher than our planes fly. All right, you can't fly over the, uh, the um, Alps there. You will, hit, uh, you will hit a mountain. When you are flying in an airplane, know that if you were going at Mount Everest, you would hit it. It is really tall. How deep the ocean is. The depth of the ocean is nothing compared to how high it is. If you took uh, Mount Everest and faced it down in the Pacific Ocean, it only goes about a sixth of the way down. <laughs> there is still five-sixths of ocean underneath of it. But if you were to take the surface of the earth, take all the water off of it, if you were to take the earth and all that, like, wow, there's hills, there's mountains, there's valleys, there's oceans, the earth is smoother than a cue ball. Okay? When you take the earth, and if you were to shrink it down to the size of a pool cue, all right, and you feel like, that feels really smooth, but I'm sure if you take a microscope to it, there's all kinds of little divots and things like that. All right, I can hit it really hard. I'm going to have a good break. There's all sorts of little divots in that. The smoothness of a cue ball, all right, the earth itself is smoother than a cue ball when you were to reduce it to that size. The earth is huge, and we have no way of thinking. I mean, God says, I want you to fill the earth. Fact number six, he says, we are to subdue the earth. So this is where I had to do most of my study. What does it mean to subdue the earth? All right? Subdue it. And that's what we're going to do. And rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing. All right. So we are to subdue it. All right? And the, the Hebrew word there is kavash. It means to conquer to subjugate, to violate, to bring into bondage, to force, to keep under, to subdue, to bring into subjection, to tread with the feet, to trample under the foot. All right? These, these are harsh words that is being used here. That is what it means to subdue the earth, to put it under our subjection, to make it our servant, our slave. Uh, when we think of the earth, everything in this earth is trying to kill us. This earth absolutely, positively, is trying to kill you. 
It will kill you if you run out of oxygen. It kills you. All right? If you get too cold, it kills you. If you get too hot, it kills you. If you get too thirsty, it kills you. If you get too hungry, it kills you. Every, if, if the wind gets fast enough, it kills you. If the earth shakes enough, it kills you. If you live close to like a, a mountain that has giant smoke coming out of it, that's a volcano and it will kill you. All right, everything in this earth tries to kill you. All right, and in the same way, again, just getting into the mindset of the person reading this thousands of years ago, using this word kavash, when you have an enemy that is trying to kill you, if you have, if your little tribe, all right, if your little village has an enemy that is trying to kill you, your only response is to kavash it. All right, your only response is to conquer them. Your only response is to defeat them. Your only res response is to put them in subjection under you. All right, so the idea of kavashing something is to conquer it so that it doesn't kill you. All right, um, the idea of what they would do back then is you know, they would take those people as slaves. And those slaves would then, instead of trying to kill them, your slaves are now going to work for you to bring success to you. They were trying to destroy you. Now they're going to bring success. Now, don't, don't understand. I'm not trying to talk about the, uh, the Jewish views of slavery and what the law talks about slavery. I'll talk a little bit more about it later. But um, it's not, that's not what it's talking about here. There are rules to slavery in, uh, in the law. All right? But talking about here, I'm just talking about the word, kavash. All right? And in this word, this idea of subduing something, all right, it's not the word to utterly destroy something. It's not the word to utterly kill something. Because you wouldn't want to do that to a servant, a slave that you have just conquered. Because if you kill them, then they, there's no help for you then. All right, there's nothing you, to hurt, to break the ankle of your slave makes a weaker slave that can't do as much work. You would want that slave to be healthy and happy. You would want that slave to be strong. All right, and vigorous so they could do the most amount of work for you. And the same is true for the earth. There is no value in hurting it. You want it to be strong and healthy so it can continue to serve its purpose of providing for you. You certainly want to, wouldn't want to hurt it beyond repair because then it wouldn't be fruitful for your children and your children's children. All right, we got one more fact before I start the long summary process. All right? I don't want you to think like, oh, he just had seven points and he's almost done. <laughs> no, not almost done. Okay? I normally have six pages. There's ten. Verse 29. God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth and every tree that is fruit yielding seeds. It shall be good for food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, was the sixth day. We are to eat both plants and and animals. The earth was created for man and not man for the earth. All right? And there's a big difference between those statements. The earth and all that's in it was created for us. Everything was created for mankind. It's not the other way around. It's not like God created the earth, created all the animals and says like, "Oh man, this is a lot of work. I got a whole universe to I got to put a caretaker on this earth. All right, go, hey, um, go hire me. Go hire me. Some, yeah, we'll, we'll make people and they'll take care of the earth for us. The earth, we were not created for the earth. The earth was created for us. And so the earth, all that's in it, plants, animals, everything, were created to keep us alive, to sustain us. It says it won't do it naturally. Naturally, because of the fall, all these things are going to try to kill you, but you are going to have the ability to subdue it. Uh, in Genesis 9, he actually puts it a little clearer. 
If you want to turn there, you may. I'm going to read from Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. It's not on the board here. All right, and this is after Noah uh, and the flood, and the, the ark is now stopped on Mount Ararat, and the waters have receded, and life is coming back, and the animals have been let forth, and God reiterates this covenant that he has made with man, this, this statement to him of saying, be fruitful and multiply. So do the, he repeats that to Noah, because Noah's starting over. There's basically eight people left on the planet now. And of these eight people left, he says, I want the same thing. I know it seems like I didn't mean the whole be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth because I killed all of you, but you were wicked. Now I'm reiterating that. The same is true. I want you to be fruitful and multiply. I want you to fill the earth. He says, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear and the terror of you will be on every beast on earth and every bird in the sky and everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish in the sea and into your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life. That is blood. Don't eat blood. Don't be a vampire. Surely... I will require your lifeblood from every beast I will require of it. And for every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. You kill someone, capital punishment. For in the image of God, he made man. As for you, be fruitful and multiply. Populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. All right? And in this... We are to eat both plants and animals and specifically make sure we understand that does not mean people. Okay? People are not to be killed. Man's blood shall not be shed. You can shed other people's blood, all right? But not man's blood. You can, you can shed the blood of animals. Eat them. That is what they're there for. Everything on this earth, plants, animals, we are to eat both of them. All right? We do it for survival. We do it because that's why God designed it. But people... People are unique creations of God and should not be killed. As we read Psalm 24 during our time of worship, which we mistakenly took as the offering time, um, it says, The earth is the Lord's and all it contains. The earth is the Lord and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. God created this earth. He created it with purpose. And the purpose of this earth was for mankind to be on it. In Isaiah 45, 18, it says this, For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens? He is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. All right, he created the earth not as some kind of just desolate wasteland like every other planet we have seen in this universe. We are observing more and more planets every single day. We are discovering more and more of them. And all we are discovering so far, I, don't, I can't predict the future, I don't know. I'm not saying what God did or didn't do. I'm just saying what facts that we have to this day. Every other planet out there is a desert wasteland. Every other planet we have found is a desert wasteland. And when he created the earth, he says, I didn't create this one as a desert wasteland. I created this one to be inhabited. Because man wasn't created for the earth. The earth was created for man. Now God gives lots of instructions in scripture on how we are to protect the earth. All right, He talks about rotating crops. He talks about letting the land rest. All right, and one aspect of this, and there were a whole bunch of passages, and if I were to read them now, I literally, the person, whoever loves the Bible the most, who loves the Bible the most in here? Oh, she wins. All right, Kathy loves the Bible the most, and if I read all the passages on rotating crops, even Kathy would be like, Joe, I'm dying. I'm dying here. That's a lot of crop rotation verses that I need to hear. You can look them up yourself if you're like, I need to read these verses on rotating crops. All right, and letting the land rest. I'm going to read one passage for us. So just bear with me for one passage, okay? One passage talking about the Sabbath. But I want you to listen carefully. 
The idea of the Sabbath, yes, is to protect the earth, to let the land rest. When you keep planting the same, uh, this is what people tell me. This is why I said Joe knows nothing on this stuff. If you keep planting the same crop in the same area, it like takes all the same nutrients out of the, the, the earth, and then all of a sudden those plants won't grow in that same spot. But when you rotate crops and you say, okay, it's going to be carrots this time and then sunflowers next time, that it takes different nutrients and replaces different nutrients and it keeps the land fertile. And then every seven years, they're not supposed to plant anything. Let the land just rest. Let the weeds grow, let the grass grow, and it'll bring nutrients back to the earth. All right? But there's a purpose to all that. The purpose isn't for the land. It's not because God loves this little ball of dirt so much that he wants you to protect it. It's, no, 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 I want to make sure this land is still good for producing fruit in the future. I want to make sure this land is still fertile for years to come. And even in the short term, I want to make sure people are taken care of. Exodus 23, verses 10 through 13. This is a passage on the Sabbath. He says, you shall sow your land, plant seeds, for six years and gather its yield. Take it all up. Uh, I don't know what other vegetables there are other than corn. That's the only vegetable I eat. But on the seventh year, you shall let it rest and lie fallow, so that the needy of your people may eat. So, yeah, even after that six years, some of the seeds are going to drop and grow up still a little bit. He says, leave them. Don't touch them. Let the needy in the land take it. You are to do the same with your vineyards and your olive groves. Six days a week, you are to do your work. But on the seventh day, you shall cease from labor, so that your ox and your donkey may rest. And the sons of your slave, your female slaves, as well as your strangers, may refresh themselves. So the people that are working the fields, give them a day of rest. Let them build their strength for animals, for servants, anybody. Now concerning everything which I said to you, be on your guard, and do not mention the name of other gods, nor let them be heard from your mouth. The, the false god worship back in that day was very much centered on the crops. You prayed for rain. You prayed for your crops to grow. And there were all sorts of different deities in what you did to this. And God is like, don't you dare. Your crops are going to grow bigger, your animals are going to be stronger, and don't you dare ever even let another God's name come to your mouth. I'm the one that does this, the Lord says. I'm the one that's doing this. And everybody else out there, everybody else in the land works seven days a week, and you only work six, and yet you have more food than they do. You have better crops than they do. You have more animals than they do. Who is your God? I want to hear it. Yahweh, that's right. All right. He wants to be known. As I said earlier, as we talked about slavery, there's a balance between working someone hard and working someone to death. Now, slavery is repugnant to us, and rightfully so, because we see the, the image bearer of God. How can a human own another human? This is, this is gross to us. And I would say, and this is a different message, I'm happy to talk to you more about it later, God feels the same way. The slavery talked about in Scripture, and there is a lot in the law about this. This was in a situation, in a scenario, in which someone was so over, you know, un overwhelmed by the debt that they owed that they could never repay. Their only recourse was to say, I, I'll work for you for free. All right? And this is how slavery would be built up. However, God says, this is the difference between you and everyone else on the planet. You, Israel, no one can be a slave for a lifetime. You let them work off that debt, and you give them the ability to work off that debt. And when the year of Jubilee hits, every 50 years, when the year of Jubilee hits, you're going to give them everything that they have earned. You're going to give them uh, a piece of land equivalent to the amount of years they worked. If they only worked a year, you wouldn't give them a giant piece of land. If they worked for 48 years, you would give them a giant piece of land for working for you for 48 years. You would give them... Uh, you would give them uh, animals and other things to help support them so that they could actually be free. No one could be a slave for their entire lifetime. All right, side note, back to the point here. Um, when it comes to the earth, 
and plants and animals. They absolutely positively should be used for our benefit. We are the image bearers. All right? And God gave the earth to us for us to subdue it. Just like there's a huge difference by the way you treat a rental car and your dream car. What's your dream car? Stephen, what's your dream car? You got a dream? All your dreams have been broken and destroyed? New charger. All right? The way you would treat a rental car versus you get that brand new charger, it's not similar. Like, you know, I mean, peel out. Like, who, who here has ever been like, you know what, I'm going to give the good gas. I'm going to put the premium gas in my rental car. All right? Nope. All right? Who here has ever said like, you know what, I really am driving a long way. I should probably get some oil. Nope. All right? We would never take care of a rental car. All right? Who cares? But our, our new charger? Yeah. We'll take care of that. That's how we should look at the earth. The earth isn't a rental. All right? The earth has been given to us. It is a gift, and a wonderful gift. And it's the only life-sustaining planet in the stinking universe that we have found. We should take care of it. <laughs> we absolutely should take it. It's like, whoa, this is mine? This is beautiful. This is incredible. All right? It's not like, you know, our mom's responsible first car that she wants to get us. It's what our dad wants to get us. All right? Responsible car, all right, is safe. All right? And ugly. All right? The car we really want isn't ugly. All right? For girls, it's cute. And for boys, it's awesome. All right? When we look at the earth, I hope you don't look at this place and say, like, it's fine. It's safe, I guess. It's like a giant ball of magma. This world is beautiful. It's incredible. If you don't think of this earth as beautiful, you haven't traveled enough. You need to get out of Newport Ritchie. Okay? All right? And people that come here are like, Look at all the palm trees. That's amazing. It's beautiful. I'm like, I guess. <laughs> it's just when, like if you're like, I'm used to snow. This is incredible. Like, okay, yeah, I guess that's nice. All right. When you then see mountains and valleys, when you see sunsets and sunrises, when you see the aurora borealis, or when you see the oceans, and when you see the beach, like there is beauty in this earth. It's incredible what God has given to us. Let's protect it. Let's keep it that way. Let's keep it nice and beautiful. There's, there's something inside of us. When we see an animal being tortured, I hope all of us has that little like rage inside of us when you see like a dog that's been abused or something, like chained up and you know sores all over them. We hate that. We all hate that because we see no purpose in an animal being tortured. All right? And rightfully so. We should never see that because there's no value in torturing an animal. There is value when killing an animal for food. There's a benefit when it comes to food. There's no benefit when we talk about dumping chemicals in the ocean as opposed to properly disposing of them. But there is benefit to things like fossil fuels. It provides heat in the winter and AC in the summer. Millions of people literally die because they are too cold or too hot. All right, we literally save lives because of that. In countries uh, with populations that have access to heat, the death rates aren't even similar to those countries uh, where uh, heat is not easily accessible. All right, it's easy to identify. In the UK, I was reading a UK study that you know around London and England, the, the, every winter the deaths are so many per population, you know, 9.2, whatever it is. All right, but in the poor areas, as you go north into Scotland and the, into Ireland, where it's simply poor, it, they're like genetically the same people, but the death rate skyrockets because they're poor. They don't have the same access to heat that the people in the cities have. All right? People literally die because they can't heat their home. So here comes the ultimate problem summary here. Um, the problem comes when people begin to deify the earth and make the earth as more valuable than people. All right? And I think there's a lot of really well-meaning, environmentally conscious people all right, that are, are good people, and I think there is a, a percentage of them that have been co-opted by forces larger than themselves. 
all right, and they've been wound into a tizzy and have been poorly explained research. All right, yes, there is a growing amount of CO2 in our atmosphere. All right, in short, that is bad for humans. All right, but what is really good, that's really good for plants. Plants breathe in CO2. The earth is greening, all right, because that's why they call them greenhouse gases. It is greening. We have more plant life on this planet than ever in recorded history, all right? And what that's going to then begin producing, I think, I don't know, I'm not a scientist, plants produce more oxygen, which is good for humans. O2 is good for people. I think we will see some value from all the greening that we are seeing over the years. I think the CO2 is coming down. However, I do think it's something worthy to be concerned about, the amount of CO2. I think it is a worthy goal for nations and people to begin to think about are there ways in which we can cut back on the amount of CO2 that we're creating? My issue usually comes in, uh, the devil's in the details. My issue usually comes in, and the way like, uh, in the Paris Accords, maybe you've heard a little bit about that. What, what that essentially is saying, to put it in a nutshell, is it makes it so that people like America and France and uh, Germany and all these countries that already have, we already have our infrastructure built, we already have, like, this is our economy, all right? And the rate of increase from us is dramatically shrunk, but it fits with our population growth and our needs for fossil fuels in the future. What it prevented was people in Africa, people in South America, all right, people in nations that they are third world nations without infrastructure, they're still rural societies. It prevents them from becoming urban societies like us. It prevents them from ramping up the need for fuel, meaning more cars and more machinery and more factories. It prevents them from doing that. But the problem is when you prevent factories from being built, it prevents things from like electricity from being brought to homes. What I think the real reason for us doing all this is, is we are only allowed, able to produce so much oil at any given time. We need more oil producers. We can only produce so much, and if all these third world nations suddenly start saying, we're going to start building all these factories so that we can bring electricity to all of our people so we can heat their homes and bring AC where they need it. When they do that, and we're going to turn everybody into actually entrepreneurs and put them in cars and let them work. When you do that, the amount of oil that these countries are need are going to far surpass the needs of America. We are tiny. We only have 300 million people of 700 billion people on the planet. We're a small little blip when it comes to the number of people on earth, all right? But a large blip when it comes to the amount of oil we use. But by preventing third world nations from getting oil, what we're ultimately doing is saying, we deserve the oil more than them. And I definitely don't like that. Now, the, what makes this difficulty, and why I said, like, this is so far out of what I'm capable of, this is way above my pay grade. I have no idea how to really research this stuff and to really deal with this stuff it is because you have people saying look oil is killing us or this is killing us or that is killing us and we've got to stop it and I, I say like ah, I think I think not having these things is killing far more people not having heat in our homes would kill far more elderly people not having heat in our homes would kill far more sick people not having heat in our homes would kill far more babies. Not having air conditioning and not having hospital facilities, not having these things kills far more people than whatever the consequences are of doing it. Saying all that is all I could say this. I can't say, I can't make political arguments and I can't say what we should be doing research-wise in the future, but this is what I can say. It is now acceptable, what I think is irreversible. I, I think there's some great technology coming out solar and wind, I think it's going to change the game. I hope it does. And I think this might become a mood argument in the near future. I hope so. But what isn't reversible is the way that people talk about people. We talk about people as being disposable. We talk about people as being um, uh, invaluable. The Paris Accords that we heard a lot about the recommendation of the lead scientist said the earth should not have more than 250 million people on it. That the only way that this earth can be sustainable is with a population less than 250 million. 
He didn't say this to the Paris Accords. He has written a paper on it. He supports mass genocide to get the population under 250 million people. He's just a scientist. He's not like a politician or anything like that. That's just his research that says, if you want to keep this planet alive, this is what you need. My answer is, saying that a few hundred people can die, you know, so what if they don't get a lot of these little third world countries? A few hundred people dying, who cares? A few thousand people dying in some of these war-torn countries, who cares? A few million people dying, I don't know who they are. They don't affect me, who cares? A few billion dying, if that means saving our planet, it's worth a few people billion dying to save our planet, right? Wrong. One person is more valuable than the entire worth of this planet. One person has more value than the entirety of this planet. Now, we aren't put in a situation where it's, are we going to destroy the planet or save this one person's life? Thankfully, the way that things play out is God says, take care of this planet. Take care of it. You rule over it. You subdue it. Treat it well so that it keeps working for you. Get as much iron out of the ground as you can to build machines. Get as much oil out of the ground as you can to operate those machines. Get as much you can. Use it and use it responsibly. This is yours. This is beautiful. This is incredible. All right, this is the, the only one you got. It's one of a kind. It's the only one off the line. It's the best one out there, and there's not another one like it. And you get to have it. I'm giving it to you. Here are the keys. Wow. We'll take care of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. But let's not miss in value what this is. I hope there is some good research that starts coming out and good science that leads to good solutions. But all I can deal with is the scope that it gives me in Scripture. And to me, there's no difference of people today than people all throughout history. As it says in Romans 1, and if you, you don't need to, I'll read it, but I'd love for you to mark Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to uh, uh, 23, and read it on your own later. I'm going to read it here. I don't think there's anything different. Our ancestors worshipped the sun. Our ancestors worshipped the trees and the rivers. And there's nothing new today. It says, for the wrath of God, Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident with them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, listen to this, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of an incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man or of birds or of four-footed animals or of crawling creatures. The world, the universe that we see screams out that there is a creator. We see a creation, there's a creator. Everything in this world screams that there is a God. But what people do is they want to ignore the, uh, the, the beauty and they want to ignore the precision. They want to ignore all the evidences that there is a creator and they instead want to worship the creation. They worship the creation. Again, in, in yesteryear, they would worship the trees or the sun or plants around, whatever they would, they would worship that. And today, our, we worship uh, the laws of nature and we worship nature itself and we worship this earth and we worship our own scientific endeavors and we worship ourselves and it's no different. We are exchanging the creator for the created. We like worshiping created things because we then get to determine how to use it. We get to determine how to live our life if there's no creator. If there is no God to oversee us, then we are our own God. But if there is a creator, what does he demand of us? Does he demand our life? Does he demand our soul? Does he demand our all? It says in Colossians 1.16, For by him all things were created, 
both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers of authorities. Listen to this. All things have been created through him and for him. So what does it mean to be a good steward of the earth? It means we need to use the earth and all that's in it for his glory. Worship team, are you able to conclude us in a song? Did I lose Darren? I lost Darren. So we can't. Okay, no problem. <laughs> if he comes back in time, I'll try to prep him. Three things. That's right up here. How we're to be a good steward of the earth. And they're easy. They're simple. But maybe uh, they're ways you haven't thought about us before. Number one, we praise him for his creation. Praise him for the beautiful things and the amazing things and the simple things and the complicated things. Praise him every time you see. Every breath you take and it's filled with oxygen, praise him. Every time your heart beats, every time you see a sunrise, a sunset, every time you hear the rain, praise him for his creation. Number two, treat people as valuable. Treat people as valuable. Remember what God, how God views the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but of everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world or condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He wants people to be saved, and I know that because he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for the sins of the world. Let's treat people as valuable as God sees people. Treat people as the image bearers of God that they truly are. And lastly, and I actually have another whole message on this later. Unless you want it now? No? Okay. It, it's be hospitable. Be hospitable with whatever little postage stamp you have as your home, as your stuff, as your resource, whatever you have on this earth. Give it to other people. Uh, I think we have lost what it means to be hospitable, I, to think why. I think we have watched too much television. Um, we see the homes uh, that the people have on TV. Uh, have you ever watched like uh, uh, House Hunters or one of those shows and it's like, um, I'm a part-time artist and uh, I'm an unemployed sculptor and our budget is a $950,000 home. Uh, and they, they buy like these extravagant, like, what? Like, you know, uh, I own my own pest company and uh, I'm a stay at home mom. Our budget is $6.4 million. Like, who are these people? Who are these people? Like, I, I don't understand. I don't understand. You're a barista at Starbucks and you are a stay at home mom and their budget's three fifty. dollars I, I just don't get it. Um, but what we've seen on television and every sitcom we see, we see these giant, beautiful homes. And then we come home to our home, and we're just like, ugh, like, it's so dirty, and it's so lived. And, and what it's turned us into is, I can't let anybody come over my house. I can't let anybody come over. I can't let anybody see this. I can't let anybody be here. All right? And, and it started, we've started to literally take our houses and build up walls around our homes and not letting people in. That, it is not how it used to be. It's not how it is in most countries in the world. When we went to Romania, um, they asked for people willing to host uh, an American. When they came, we needed to stay one night in homes before we went to the camp. And literally every person in the church popped their hands up. And they said, okay, uh, they're Amer you have to have a, a running toilet. And about half the hands went down. They says, okay, you have running And no dirt floors. And a couple more hands went down like, okay. You can host them. Um, the people that were like, I want them to stay with me. All right? I will give them the good bucket. Um, they warned us. They said, whatever they feed you, whatever they give you, you eat it. That's probably about a week's worth of food that they're going to give you because they think you're going to eat a lot. And they're right. You will. All right? We're losing this mentality. Here's the fix to this. It, it's, if we can't invite people into our homes... We're not going to be quick to give people our stuff. And if people need a place, to a place to sleep, give them a place to sleep. If they need food to eat, give them food to eat. If they need something, give it to them. But 
this is practice. We've got to practice. Practice inviting your church family over to your house. Practice inviting them over. I know there might be anxiety to that. It's about like, I have kids. I have kids. Yeah. Yeah. They probably had at some point or still do. Start inviting them over. Start practicing that hospitality so that when you actually need to be hospitable with someone in the world, when you actually need it, it won't be the first time. You're like, I have no idea how to do this. You've practiced. I know what it means to be hospitable. I've been, I've been showing hospitality to my church family. I've been practicing. I've been trying to get over that anxiety. So when I actually see someone in need, I'm very quick to say, yeah, yeah. Whatever you need, I got. Let's close in prayer. God.